world, uh, and also some of the greatest activists, uh, who are also some of the greatest minds uh, in, in the world, people who have fought to make our democracy more equitable uh, from uh, desks, from pulpits, from uh, city streets, uh, to to classrooms. And so we are excited uh, about concluding uh, this experience with, with, with three phenomenal, three phenomenal uh, public thinkers, uh, persons who fuel uh, the work of justice through their, their the work of justice uh, through their through their scholarship, uh, people who allow their classrooms uh, to be places where where freedom uh, is is practiced, and I think that is always important to say, even as we continue to remember the legacy of bell hooks, that that teaching is or should be a practice of freedom. And so we have three educators uh, that are that are with us today, two that are currently with us, and we're hoping that that that, that the third a professor will join us. Uh, soon, uh, but I just wanted to offer us another welcome, another welcome uh, into, in, into this space, another welcome into uh, this, this cyber gathering. We've been framing uh, these, th these four weeks as, as digital brush harbors, as, as opportunities for us to still away outside of the gaze of, of white supremacy, outside of the gaze of, of racial capitalism, uh, an opportunity to, to do what, what my ancestors practiced. Uh, after they left uh, the, the plantation, going into the clearings of the woods and being able to affirm their own humanity to, to tap into what uh, Dr. King would call somebodiness uh, after living a, a, a daily reality of the onslaught of nobodiness, uh, of plantation life, of chattel life, which morphed into uh, segregation uh, life. And so here's our opportunity for reflection, for planning as we gear up for a, a, a year for the, for the rest of the year to be a year of, of action and a year of, of dismantling uh, these very systems that seem to be so stubborn, uh, even to the best of our goodness, uh, the, the best of our moral imagination, the best of our advocacy uh, and activism. Uh, we see that, 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 that evil knows how to morph and evil knows how to reform. Uh, and so that is why, that is why I'm so delighted uh, to have to have these these two scholars that that are currently uh, with us let me say a word of prayer and then we will we will hear from uh, these two the, these these two uh, persons who really prime the pumps of, of American uh, scholarship and, and and public intellectualism uh, as it relates to uh, law as it relates to democracy and as it relates to to movement history God we're so excited about the opportunity to declare you again uh, an abolitionist, a God of abolition, a God of repair, a God of justice, for it is in those Hebrew scriptures where we are told that you require us to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. God, we're grateful that humbly walking with you is actually an empowering experience. Walking humbly with you is an opportunity to negate uh, the humiliating forces of the world around us, an opportunity to, to embellish the core of who we are in productive ways and reminding ourselves that we do not come from the pages of a nation's history, but we are really people who come from your expansive cosmic imagination. And because of that cosmic imagination that gives birth to us into the world, we know that we are in a democracy that we co-create, that we co-govern, a democracy that should lend and, and, and move on the whim of people particularly uh, those of us who are committed to egalitarian justice, those of us who are committed to the redistribution of power, the redistribution of resources. Uh, God, we take these moments so seriously uh, because we have this opportunity to make your kingdom real, to make what Dr. King called the beloved community real, uh, to even fight for a beloved economy that gives teeth to a beloved community. We pray this prayer with great expectation of a conversation that will propel us from reflection into action. It is in your name we pray, amen. Amen. 
All right. All right. Again, thank you all for, for being uh, with us uh, today. We do not take for granted uh, the, the amount of time that you've invested on these, on, on these Wednesday evenings uh, for, for, for discourse, uh, for opportunities to, to be reminded of just how powerful uh, the role of, of, of the resident and the citizen is in making a nation live up to what it says it is uh, on, on paper. I am excited to welcome uh, to this place, uh, Dr. Uh, William Jones. Uh, Dr. Jones is a professor of history uh, at the University of Minnesota, and he brings uh, to this work an intersectional approach, and I'm sure each of, each of, of our our scholars today uh, would also uh, say that they do intersectional work, but uh, we're particularly excited about the way uh, his work uh, intersects, uh, the way he tells history, the way he uncovers, excavates American history is at the intersection of, of race and class, uh, which we know we, we should not uh, be, untether uh, because they they cannot be uh, unwedded so we, we're grateful for for the work of, of, of dr jones being with us today and we're also uh, grateful to have uh, professor cheryl cashin uh, with us today who is a professor at georgetown law school uh, she is also a regular contributor to politico uh, she also uh, helps she she writes very deeply uh, very concertedly uh, about segregation uh, in here uh, in 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 our country, and so we have this this gift of being greeted by by two people uh, who can see this on a micro level and on a macro level because of of, of the work that they've elected uh, to do, and we're grateful that they do this work. It makes it makes our work of activism. It works. It makes our work of preaching actually. It makes my work of preaching and writing uh, easier uh, because of, of of the work that they do. So to Dr. Jones and, and Professor Cashin, welcome uh, to to Mount Zion, and welcome again to to Building One America, which I believe uh, you both are. are familiar with I know I know Professor Cashin uh, has has a uh, deep history uh, with with our with our organization and so uh, P Professor Jones however you you want to ground us uh, however you want to enter uh, into this space by 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 way of introductory remarks we're with you okay thank you well thank you for including me it's an honor to be here um it's also nice to at least virtually be back in Jersey I was um I started my professor career at New Brunswick at uh, at Rutgers in New Brunswick, and um, and so it's good to be back. Um, as as Pastor Willie said, I my work centers on the relationship between race and class, and my um, my scholarship examines the ways in which, particularly the ways in which African Americans have experienced both. Um, racism and economic inequality in ways that I think have been profound, had a profound impact on the shape of American politics. Um, my, so my, my last book examined the March on Washington in 1963, which I think we're all familiar with in terms of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, but it's often forgot that that was a, uh, a march for jobs and freedom. And it was a, a march that was actually led by uh, African American labor activists. It was organized and led by uh, labor activists who put together a broad coalition of um, mostly black activists, but also black and white activists uh, around the idea that freedom and equality could not be achieved without access to decent jobs and to decent income and, the, and the, all of the things that come out of that. So. Um, I, 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 I'm eager to talk more about that um, and to think about the ways in which I think that the, the lessons from that history remain very relevant for the moment that we're living in today. Thank you, thank you so much. Professor Cashin, enter however uh, you, feel, you feel most drawn. Okay, well, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I, I have to say, while I was born and raised uh, in Huntsville, Alabama, the child of civil rights activists, my mother was from Jersey City, New Jersey, and I have very fond members, memories of being shipped to grandma's house in Jersey City. So I, in some ways, I'm a daughter of New Jersey. <laughs> Y'all can, I'll claim that tonight. 
Um, and I, you know, I, I'm going to give you a very quick overview of my most recent book. It's, it's, it's came out in September. It's the culmination of two decades of my life's work. I've been obsessed with the role of segregation geography in the persistence of inequality. And in a nutshell, I'm gonna play a four minute film for you um, in part because I'm mentally tired and I think the film does a really good job of encapsulating what I'm saying. But I basically say that you can't understand the persistence of racial and economic inequality in this country without understanding the role of geography. Um, and we have a caste system where geography is at the center of it. So I'm gonna play that for you. And that'll just cue up um, what I have been obsessed with and what my, my work is, is, is very much about and what this most recent book is about. And then I'm really interested in entering the conversation however you want, you want to go. So let me begin, I'll pull up, um, let me just, uh, I've got the film queued up. Now I need to share my screen. I always get so nervous when I'm having to do these things. I've done it, I do it all the time for my students, but it just makes me so nervous that something's gonna go wrong. Okay, um, can you see my screen? I'm about to go full screen on this film, okay. America's residential past is destroying opportunity. If, if high opportunity is sequestered only in certain places, neither cities, nor struggling suburbs, nor far out rural hamlets are an engine of opportunity in this country anymore. We're not the land of opportunity in this system of residential caste. So I've been a professor at Georgetown Law for 25 years. And I've written a new book, White Space, Black Hood opportunity hoarding and segregation in the age of inequality. And in that book, I'm shining a light on American residential caste. So American residential caste is a system that was intentionally constructed to create affluent white spaces separated and apart from high poverty black neighborhoods. We overinvest in and exclude in affluent white space and we disinvest and prey upon the people trapped in the hood. So there are three anti-Black processes that undergird residential caste. Boundary maintenance, opportunity hoarding, and stereotype-driven surveillance. Boundary maintenance is a polite word for segregation. The most persistent types of neighborhoods in large metropolitan or even medium metropolitan areas is a fluent white space and high poverty minority neighborhoods, particularly black neighborhoods. They have persisted and the boundaries to those two types of neighborhoods have gotten harder. We're more segregated now um, than we were 20 years ago at these polar extremes. Opportunity hoarding is over investing in affluent majority white space uh, and disinvesting elsewhere, particularly in black neighborhoods. We tend to, you know, use exclusionary zoning, neighborhood assignment, the boundaries of jurisdictions to hoard the opportunities there. Golden infrastructure and in schools, wonderful transportation, job rich social networks. Everyone else who's excluded from those high opportunity environments subsidizes that, right? through taxation, through gasoline taxes, that gorgeous golden infrastructure is paid for and subsidized by the people who are excluded. And then the third is stereotype-driven surveillance by police and by private citizens. As with slavery and Jim Crow, um, a lot of non-Black citizens have been conscripted into policing back bodies. Stereotype-driven surveillance, driven by this idea that, that that kind of behavior is deserved in, in majority black neighborhoods. Police go through there with the lens, uh, you know, every young man is presumed a thug rather than a citizen. The beauty of once you understand the processes, 
they actually provide the way forward. You basically abolish and reverse them. Inclusion rather than exclusion with boundary makes. Uh, giving historically defunded neighborhoods priority in investing rather than opportunity hoarding and, and disinvesting in blackness. Humanization and care rather than stereotype driven surveillance. A city that's gone through abolition repair, what I imagine and envision is that they will have returned to being engines of opportunity, particularly for poor people in poor neighborhoods. See them as assets and give them a chance to be an agent in their own liberation. Okay. That's my book. Hi, I'm it. Michelle Tafoya coming to you live from oh, Tokyo. I and this is Studio A. This is the home oh. of Tokyo Live on NBC. Oh. Okay. <laughs> did I stop the share successfully? Yes, yes, yes you yeah. did. Yes, you did. Thank you so much, uh, Professor mm -hmm. Cashin, uh, for, for introducing us to, to your work uh, videographically. Uh, let, let, let's hop in. D Dr. Jones, Dr. Jones, you, you, you mentioned, you really teed up for us uh, your, your your project around the 1963 March on Washington, which we know there there, there was a, a labor undercurrent uh, to that work, maybe much more uh, than we often think about in terms of, uh, of how we engage America's uh, popular history. We often don't see uh, what Dr. King was doing, uh, you know, what, 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 what Rosa Parks was doing, uh, what a, a wealth of, of persons that, that we can name who, who were really, we, we now look back and call this, this pantheon of, of, of civil rights, civil rights leaders, civil, civil rights um, warriors. Uh, but we often don't talk about that relationship between both, both labor and civil rights. Uh, and I think, uh, if, if I'm correct, you, you spend a lot of time also thinking about how Black labor leaders, uh, one, is a category of leadership within itself, which we don't often think about. We, we, we sort of think about the labor movement as a sort of bleached uh, justice movement uh, in the country, devoid of, of racial emphasis, uh, devoid, uh, divorced from, from the civil rights movement. Can you say a bit about, uh, about this, this relationship between labor and civil rights uh, as, 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 as a power coalition from the past, but also can you tease out for us maybe some of the opportunities that exist now uh, for, for, for this, this sort of labor, civil rights, uh, working class white folk uh, and black folk making a, 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 an imprint on this iteration of, 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 of Jim Crow-ness? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you're right. You you said I think I think we often when we talk about a sort of labor civil rights coalition, we think of white labor and black civil rights coming together around. And and actually, I think that is misleading in the sense that you know I, I think one thing that you know King talked, Dr. King talked a lot about is the fact that black people are predominantly working people, right? And so labor is also black people, right? And you can see that very much in the March on Washington. In fact, the leadership, the primary leadership of the March on Washington goes back to A. Philip Randolph, who was at the time recognized as the leader of that march. And he's often forgotten today, um, but, by, but he was somebody who came out of a lifetime of labor activism um, going back to the First World War, to the 19 teens and 1920s. Um, and he actually initiated the idea of a march on Washington in the 1940s during the Second World War and organized a march and then called it off at the last minute. And when he did that, he said, we can organize another march. And what happened in 1963 was actually the march that he had envisioned back in 1941. Um, so, and in his view, labor was actually the, the, the demands of labor and the access to jobs and, uh, and the ability to form unions was really at the center of what he saw as the black freedom struggle. So it was primary. Um, it, he connected that agenda to, um, to things like, like voting rights and the struggle against segregation um, and that's why the march was called a march for jobs and freedom, right? That was sort of connecting those, what he saw as two sides of the black freedom struggle. Um, 
In addition to a Philip Randolph, a really important leadership of the march was a younger set of black labor activists who had come of age in the 1940s and 1950s. And they were really at the center of the organizing in their workplaces. Um, they were, you know, shop stewards, local labor, labor federation leaders. Um, but importantly, they were also people who had tremendous uh, leadership in their communities. So many of them were deacons of their churches. They were presidents of the local branches of the NAACP. Um, they were heads of fraternities and sororities. Um, that So they, when they, they were, on one hand, they were labor leaders, but they were also community leaders. And they had the kind of leadership in their communities that when they asked people to go to Washington, people would listen and they know how to get them to Washington, right? So they could mobilize people. And I think that's a really important, so I think there are, there are three things that I would point to about the labor movement that I think is important for thinking about politics. One is that it is a, it's a movement that's focused on people's economic justice and people's economic security, which I think is often forgotten and I think is important to bring to the fore. But these are also political institutions in which people build leadership skills and networks that are, are critical if you're going to mobilize people. Um, and finally, they're, they're institutions that are controlled by working people. And that is also very rare in our society. And I think that puts them in a unique position to sort of put the concerns of working people forefront. Um, so, what I think really came together in the March on Washington were these labor leaders, these black labor leaders who had connections to institutions that could also bring in white working class people, um, but that, but they could set the, the agenda and set the tone for the movement. And I think the, those are things that um, I think remain relevant in sort of providing opportunities and lessons today. I mean. The fact is that black people are much more likely to belong to unions than any other racial group in the United States. Um, in part, that's because, um, because of this history, but it's also because of the, the concentration of black people in jobs that you know, need the protection from unions. Um, and what that means is that you know, we have, um, We've also the union movement itself has been transformed in part again by the history that I write about in this book, um, to the point that there are black people in in powerful positions in the union movement that can use those positions uh, to influence the union movement. So um, I think it's important again to think about a sort of the contemporary opportunities that um, unions provide for um, emphasizing issues around economic justice, for being institutions in which people can develop leadership and develop um, networks, uh, and, and places that are, are in which Black working people have leadership and, and, and influence in ways that I think are rare today. Good. Thank, thank, thank you. Professor Cashin, you, in, in, in your book, I, I, I love, I, you know, I've, I was gripped by the idea, uh, reading through it, uh, around opportunity hoarding. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the way you talk about stereo, stereotype driven surveillance has been helpful for, for a project I'm thinking, a project I'm working through now, a proposal uh, I'm working through now on, on policing and segregation uh, and, and, and how policing segregation is one of the cheap roles of, of American policing. You, you were helpful uh, for, for that. T tonight, as you came in, you, 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 you dropped the C word uh, that, that we don't often use uh, in American uh, public discourse uh, for, for whatever reason. Uh, the word caste is not something that, that we readily uh, lend, our, lend ourselves to uh, as, as a way of describing what we're experiencing here uh, in America about what it means to be trapped in particular social locations, uh, to be born into and to be condemned to those social locations that you're born into. We don't really think about that because there's still this myth of America, right? This, all of us, you know, in somewhere or another, uh, and, and, and maybe this is less true, 
uh, for, for black and brown uh, communities, but, but it's definitely true for poor white folk uh, of this, like everybody can be Horatio Alger. We can all move from, from rags uh, to, to riches, which, which really disallows us to think about the way our, our nation functions as, 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 a, as a, a very intricate caste system. Can you say a word to us uh, about caste? Like, wh what do you mean by caste? Uh, and then perhaps help us think through how race and class in this country sort of rendezvous in caste, how, how, how I, this caste structure of America is both race and class uh, and not either or. Okay, so in pre-civil rights America, we had a caste system in the Jim Crow South that was based exclusively on race. It didn't matter what your class was. You were excluded from lots of the liberties of, of, of citizenship, right? In post-civil rights America, we have a caste system that's at the intersection of race, your economic status, and where you live. Um, all of those things uh, intersect. And here's the point. Um, if you lost the neighborhood lottery and happened to uh, be a child living in concentrated poverty of whatever color, but particularly if you're living in concentrated black poverty, you live in a system of containment that is designed for you to fail, right? That, that um, where getting out is exceptional. Um, you 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 know uh, social. Mo there's very little child social mobility in high poverty census tracts, right? Meanwhile, if you're at the other extreme, you won the neighborhood lottery, you know, and you're in a high poverty. I mean, a high opportunity poverty free, free place, and the one would not exist without the other. You can't have poverty free havens without concentrating it elsewhere. You rise easily and naturally on all of the benefits there, right? And as I said in the film that I played, um, increasingly the boundaries to these neighborhoods are hardening. It's getting harder to get into high opportunity spaces and it's getting harder to get out of the hood. That is a caste system. Descendants trapped in the hood, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say they are, uh, if not at the bottom of the social order, really low down. They are othered by a lot of people, including higher income black people. That's a caste system. All of the systems are set against you. Does that make sense? Yeah, make, make sense to me, makes sense to me, makes sense to me. We are actually uh, I'm so grateful that that our our other scholar has, has joined us uh, tonight. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Trout, uh, for, for, for being uh, with us. Uh, Pro Professor uh, Trout, you, would you, uh, each, each panelist had an opportunity to, to sort of enter the space, however, however they, they felt led, uh, sort of grounding how they're showing up. So if you wanna just tell us a bit about how you're showing up, it could be experiential, it could be connected to your, your academic interests, your, your research, interest but but what however you want us to get to know you uh, before we start asking questions uh, I invite okay. you to do that well thank you so much for having me and I really want to apologize for coming late um, I, I had I had double booked this evening and so I'm full of housing thoughts if you have questions about housing I, I just came off a city of Newark conversation about housing because the organization that I run at Rutgers Law School, um, does a lot of work with the city about affordable housing and housing related issues. But I'm David Trout, I'm a professor of law at Rutgers Law School. The reason I'm here is really because I follow Cheryl Cashin wherever <laughs> she goes. She has no idea. That's that's me in your rear view mirror. That, <laughs> that, that's that car again, right? Um, but that's that's I'm actually telling half the truth there. I really do follow uh, Professor Cashin and her work very closely. Um, I teach civil rights law. I, um, I, I teach other things too at the law school, but I, I run and I have for the last 10 years run um, an, a research institute at Rutgers Law School called CLIMB, the Center on Law, Inequality and Metropolitan Equity. And it is, um, it's, a, it's an institute 
devoted to interdisciplinary public scholarship on place-based inequality and systemic racism. And so we look at a variety of issues um, and we very often work with community groups and, and, and other partners uh, to try to shine light on some of the issues I imagine you all are looking at, but also um, to try to, to be uh, focused on remedies, to be focused on, on how impact is created, how change occurs. And so, as I said, a lot of that work has focused on Newark in the last several years, but on a few other areas as well. So that's, that's me, um, that's, that's my background. Um, and I'm just so glad to be here and sorry to be late. Uh, th thanks so much, uh, Professor Trout. I think, I mean, you, 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 you raised housing, and and we have we've we we we've, we've talked about housing a bit uh, to to tonight, uh, not, not much, but but we, we we started to to engage that conversation since you since you raised it. I think it is important. So this movement is a movement that is that is. Um, very stubbornly interested in in in, in abolishing school segregation, uh, and and we know that that school segregation maps alongside uh, residential uh, segregation, uh, our residential caste uh, system here uh, in 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 America. In in fact, there's been some 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 research uh, that that our coalition has has uh, analyzed and put out that that suggests that the schools. In this, the school districts in this state are actually more segregated than, than the municipalities uh, uh, in, in, in this state. Uh, just, I mean, we've been, we've been leaning into history a, a bit tonight, and, and I would like to do that again with you. Uh, what we have not done this month was actually talk about the, 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 the tragedy of redlining in any uh, concerted way. Uh, and so, I, I, you know, I welcome you to, to give us maybe, uh, you know, a thought or two on, on redlining here in, in New Jersey uh, and to some extent how we're still living in the consequences uh, of, of, of that redlining. Well, you know, one thing I, I, I point out in the redlining discussion that I think is almost an odd point that's it's, it's frequently forgotten is that redlining was the design of the landscape for economic benefit, according to race and caste, as Professor Cashin puts it, but specifically within, within the terms of real estate investment and development, which is to say then that it, it is, was truly systematic because it was going to act as the conduit for all the relevant institutional funding that helps to make an area, an area of high opportunity, middle opportunity, low opportunity, right? Was we're not making loans here. What redlining says is we're not insuring properties and businesses here. And without, without lending, without a strong financial, without financial institutions supporting a particular area, it would necessarily mean that there was disinvestment there because nobody, no rational investor is going to take on that much risk. So what's important to remember is that when you have done this to an area, you have set a course for the, and all the institutions upon it that will very likely last for generations. The built environment is not a 10, 15 year deal, right? The built environment often lasts in, 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 in terms of hundreds of years. And so what researchers are finding now, not surprisingly, is that areas that were redlined have been systematically financially crippled in every conceivable way because of the, that was really meant to chart a course of financial life. So it shouldn't surprise us that home values are lower in these areas, that tax bases are lower in these areas, that public services um, are struggling in these areas, that, that poverty concentrates in these areas, that affordability, believe it or not, is actually least in these areas compared to areas in which for generations, they've been considered safe investment risks. 
They've been supported by all the things that a capitalist society does to support investment and growth. So these areas that I did an article many years ago, I, I, I called anti because they exist outside of ordinary markets, through the process of redlining and through the exclusions that, that to use Professor Cashin's word again, contained black people and others, but in these, in, in these redlined areas, it just became virtually impossible to see the kind of growth that would lead to the kinds of, of wealth, of household wealth and, and institutional wealth that is just something we take for granted in the reproduction of opportunity in this country. So we are constantly behind that, you know, because wealth builds upon wealth and the absence of wealth, you know, recreates its own absence. And so that's what we're struggling with right now. And, um, and so, so, so things like redlining are absolutely critical, not as some sort of historical relic, but really as a way of understanding the present. And could I interject a second? Just sure, to, please, to please, please. It's so good to see you, my brother. I'm so <laughs> <glad you got laughs> here. <laughs> so good to see you. David and I were in law school together. We go back, way back. Um, but um, I cite a Fed study from it was just two three years ago in which they found that most of the neighborhoods that were marked with a d for and and redlined as hazardous the lowest grade d in the 30s eight decades on presently that decision correlates with disinvestment and there's like new generations of redlining black all these credit studies black people you know who are equally credit worthy with, with, with whites are often um, given substandard or, or denied loans altogether, right? So it just, it just never stopped from the beginning. It is a present practice. It's not just history. So we, we're talk, so we know, uh, and, and the, the data says that the majority of black and brown kids actually don't go to school in, in our central cities. Uh, they actually go to school in, in, in our suburbs, which says something in, in New Jersey, particularly, that, which says something about uh, the, 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 the racial diversity that, that you find in suburbs that, that did not exist in, I, I guess we would say, uh, when, when redlining proper uh, was, was happening, when, when redlining was, 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 was the dominant policy uh, and, and, and practice. So I want to ask us a question. Um, but like, what does it mean? What does segregation mean now for our suburban communities, right? These, 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 these multiracial resegregating suburbs where so many black and brown families live now alongside working class white families. Um, what, what, what's, what's at stake now for conversations around desegregation, breaking up uh, opportunity hoarding when we now consider that these suburbs are no longer lily white, but so many of these suburbs are actually resegregating. And we see that even from those places, opportunity is walking out of the back door. What does that mean for us now as we organize uh, to end segregation? And this for anyone who wants to jump in or, or just call the question baloney, however you wanna uh, approach it, let's open it. Well, I'll say this, it's, it's challenging because, um, you know, we, we, we about, um, I don't know how long ago it's been now, several months ago, we did a, a big study of the affordability gap in Newark in order to demonstrate that there are, um, there's a need for over 16,000 affordable units by an adjusted measure of affordability that is much closer to the actual income needs and the measure of rent burden for the average Newarker. Not what HUD says based on uh, um, area median income, but based on, on, on renter incomes in the city of Newark and what people can afford to live on. And then we recently did um, a subsequent look at some of the surrounding suburbs. There is a, a line of predominantly black suburbs adjacent to the city of Newark that we're curious to know what the extent of 
of, of the affordability gap was there. And we found that it was almost as pronounced in, in, those, in those predominantly black and increasingly brown suburbs as they were in the city of Newark. But of course, here's the difference, right? When you talk to the mayors of those municipalities versus the mayor of Newark, they're seeing very little growth. They're seeing uh, very little investment. They have many fewer levers available to them as, as public officials to invite investment, to strengthen their, their tax base, to alter the quality of their institutions on behalf of their residents. And this is just a feature of suburban life, that the, the, the self-sufficiency model of suburbs based primarily upon property values doesn't work when 70% of your residents are, are renters. Doesn't work where property value uh, appreciation is minimal you know, year after year after year. So you're not building growth, you're not building wealth and you're not increasing the tax base. And so you're not improving your services. And, and here's the kicker. The kicker is that these are places of course, that as Newark becomes more expensive, Newark's poorest residents who are displaced then try to go, mm. right? So now there are these, 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 these suburbs like Irvington are absorbing more and more of Newark's poor, but they don't have nearly the resources or the institutions to support them. So I imagine that this is happening across the state that, um, that, that municipalities that just were never built with the kinds of social service and institutional infrastructure necessary for opportunity are suddenly finding themselves um, with populations for which they really, uh, for which they, they really don't have the resources to care adequately. You know, can I just add? Okay, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go, go on, William. I, I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to, add the the additional factor of um you know that like things like housing the unaffordable housing part of what's happening is that housing is too expensive for people who have certain incomes but another factor in that is that people have those incomes right they have low incomes and i think this shows the ways in which you know when you have people moving from one municipality to another the the issue is as much segregation as as much uh, employment segregation and job segregation and segregation into jobs that where incomes are low. So, you know, you can address that by trying to build more affordable housing, which is a good thing. But another way to address that is to increase wages. And that's actually, I think, when we go back and look at the long history of housing segregation, you know, the, the part of what drove the appreciation of housing values in white neighborhoods were was federal programs aimed at investing in housing, right? You had HUD and, you know, you had a whole array of federal programs to provide people with mortgages. But that was always coupled with programs like enc encouraging unionization, the, the um, making making it easier to form unions and um, providing things like minimum wage laws and social security laws that were trying to address the income side of that factor. And I think you can't leave that out when you think about trying to fight for equality, that that access to the to the the levers that one, someone can use to increase their income is really going to be critical for fighting any of these um, patterns of segregation. Yeah, I'm, I actually believe that it might be easier to get, you know, a national 15 hour wage than to do anything to disrupt this hundred year process, of seriously disrupt segregation. But I think we should continue to fight the fight. Oh, the two things I wanted to add um, to this conversation was that concentrated poverty is growing fastest in the suburbs um, for a lot of the reasons that, that have been described. Um, a lot of, you know, uh, white areas or majority white areas are, are becoming rapidly impoverished. Um, and segregation is getting worse where, you know, city and suburb. Um, 
There's a study released last summer by the Othering and Belonging Institute, which found that in something like 80% or more of cities above 200,000, whether they're city or suburb, a population of more than 200,000, segregation has grown worse in the last 20 years, you know? So uh, it's really, really tough. But you taught your question, Pastor Willie, was about school segregation, right? Or I mean, that was that's the battle y'all are fighting, right? That, that's definitely the battle uh, that we're fighting, which right. we're They're equally difficult when you know you have jurisdictions with boundaries that that can you know separate be separate. But it, it's happening in suburbs. Um, it's happening all over. This this is I, mean, I think that's a good point. Uh, this, this last point, particularly talking about these 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 legal boundaries, right? These these mm -hmm. jurisdictional boundaries. I often hear, you know, I I I wrote I, I wrote a few pieces on on segregation, and you know, I usually get you know the kind of hate mail that says, oh, you don't know anything about segregation. Uh, you know, you don't want to know what it was like in Jim Crow South. You're too, you're too young uh, to even know what you're talking about. I, I get that. I get that regularly. And, you know, there's so many myths about why uh, communities are uh, uniracial, why communities are uniclass, uh, the, the, you know, Class homogenous, like there, there. These myths around right. uh, so you know, one of I, I often call it social naturalism. No, people naturally are drawn to people of the same economic status. People are naturally drawn uh, to to people of the same race. It it it, it sort of undergirds this myth of choice. And so, because we don't have white only you know colored only signs, uh, because we don't have the kind of public faith, you know, racism with a frown anymore. We, we now have racism with a smile. Uh, the, we actually do buy into the myth that people live where they live by choice, uh, that people go to school, that parents send their kids to school, uh, where they send them to school by choice. Can, can you, can you, can, can we uh, start to disrupt that, that myth and, and to, to, to help us understand how policy is still at work in where almost all of us live. Policy is still at work in terms of how much many of us can make. Policy is still at work with where we send our kids to school. And this myth of choice is really a mask that serves to, to protect white supremacy and protect white opportunity hoarding and protect uh, segregation. So, so let's, let's have some exchange around, around how we disrupt this myth of choice and we're able to say, no, policy is still at work. Well, one thing I, I try to show in my book and I, I have a chapter called Ghetto Mythology, that, but one thing is very clear is that um, the, whoever controls the narrative controls the policy choices, right? And, 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 you know, with each black subordinating institution, there was a mythology in the narrative to justify slavery, to justify Jim Crow, to justify not allowing black people um, to live where they wanted, right? Um, they're pathological, you know, all, all of, and, and, the, and the major participants in this anti-black mythologizing which justifies segregation, you know, a lot of them have been presidents and presidential aspirants, you know? Um, so the refreshing thing though, that I'm seeing, I try to lift them up in, in my, my, one of my recent pieces for Politico was an MLK day piece about progressive cities that have a different vision or at least are beginning, you know, it's like baby steps, but are, are beginning to try to create something different, have a different lot, you know, the narrative changed in some context because of George Floyd's slow assassination. You know, there's some people, you know, I'm in the neighborhood, there's still the Black Lives Matter signs up, right? And what, what I argue is that um, whether your goal is integrating schools or, in, or integrating neighborhoods, or getting racial equity in the funding or greenlining these historically defunded neighborhoods. I think we need to do all of it. Um, the first step is uh, changing the lens that are applied to descendants. 
changing the lens that's applied to black people, poor black people from presumed thug to presumed citizen. And I, you know, I say, once you free yourself up from that dogma and that the state does, it frees you to focus on evidence-based strategies that um, create better outcomes for taxpayers. You know, integration works when it's achieved, you know, for school achievement and everything else, right? So um, the one thing that gives me a little bit of hope right now, I said a little bit, <laughs> is that in, in progressive cities, and I, I, I gave a shout out to Newark in my MLK Day piece, right? Cities that are not where popular will is not suppressed, for example, by a hostile state legislature, um, are, are free to experiment. And there's a lot of exciting um, equality innovation going on, a lot of social experiments going on. And yes, yeah, some interesting things going on in Newark. So I just want to say that, but, but that you, the, the narrative has to change, you know. Um, I hope that's helpful. Oh, no, that's extraordinarily helpful. And it, it reminded me that that L.A. did something uh, pretty significant. Uh, the, the L.A. City Council did something pretty significant in terms of endorsing a, a, a universal jobs guarantee or, or, or saying that that it would, you know, rightly, rightly uh, administer a federal jobs guarantee, you know, a, a guarantee that's federally funded and, and locally administered. Uh, I think I think they may be the, the first big city uh, to, to do something like that. I could be wrong, uh, but, but the fact that you have a city as large as LA that is talking about universal employment I think is I think that that that's the kind of progressivism uh, that 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 I feel you were mentioning uh, in your King Day piece and and and, te and teasing out out here. I, I, anyone else want to address uh, that particular question about disrupting this myth of choice and and how and how we pinpoint how policy is at work? I mean, I think Professor Cashin's really right that there are these places, you know, and they are, you know, these they they are mostly cities. Um, I think not not entirely large cities, but where there are really important experiments going on. And you know, in in St. Paul, Minnesota, where I live, we recently passed by a popular referendum of a cap on rent increases that was you know promoted as as you know very explicitly as helping um, low income communities of color who were you know that basically basically extraordinary. Um, rent increases only affect low-income renters. Uh, people who pay high rent tend to see their rents go up at pretty minimal uh, rates. You know, they pay high rent, but it doesn't go up, you know, 10% in one year. Um, and so it's, the, it's all the low-income renters who are affected by this. And this referendum got huge pushback by, from real estate firms and, and developers but it passed by the, you know, the, 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 um, the community came out and supported it. Um, it's, it's got lots of pushback now and there's lots of complications in it. But I think these types of experiments, um, the, my, St. Paul also recently passed the guaranteed um, basic income as a pilot, right? And I think, you know, looking at these things, the, you know, these, these are small experiments, right? Often in small places, but they, I think, demonstrate that these types of things can be effective. And I think they do counteract a lot of the mythology around, you know, people making choices to live, the, you know, to the, that these are sort of personal choices as opposed to structural problems. Yeah, yeah. And, and th thinking about, about, uh, you know, cities uh, that, that may not be as large as LA doing, doing these progressive move, uh, ma making these progressive shifts in, in narrative and, and in policy, you know, the UBI, the universal basic income, uh, you know, one of the first places, if not the place was Stockton, California. I don't, I don't know right. how large Stockton is. It's, it's a city, no doubt, but it's not a large city. So even thinking about how, uh, and, and, and Dr. Cash and Professor Cash in, in her article, she does name, uh, you know, medium sized cities as well, not just these, these, these sprawling places uh, that, that we often think of when we think of cities, but no, I think this is really helpful. Uh, I think 60 cities now have pledged to do a UBI. Mm. You, can, you can look at this website, Mayors for a Universal Basic Income. I think they're up to 60. 
and, it, and it's Stockton and, you know, uh, I'm forgetting the former mayor of Stockton. Who, was it Michael Tubbs? Michael Tubbs, that's Michael it. Michael Tubbs, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, we, we we're at the we're at the hour. We we've transgressed it uh, by 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 three minutes, and this has been four weeks of of reflection, uh, four weeks of imagination. Uh, we've we've gotten an opportunity to to think about where we've been uh, with civil rights activist who, who's now in his nineties, uh, a post civil rights activist who's who's in his. 70s, uh, late 70s, moving into his 80s. Uh, we got to hear from young activists, uh, young scholars, policy thinkers. Um, to, so, so we've gotten the opportunity to reflect and also use uh, neural capacity to think about a world that we've never seen before. Uh, and, and action is gonna be a big part of this. Uh, the reflection, imagination, great, but we're really going, going to need action uh, to, to do this. And so I, as we leave, I hope the three of you all will say just a word. We'll feed our imagination about what our action can do uh, based on this based on this question. How can, what kind of action? How can we repair the harm uh, that segregation is doing? Uh, not just to our central cities, uh, not just to, to black folk, but to our suburbs and to, to, to working class white people. How, how do we repair this harm? Well, I just wanna say um, that um, it's, it's it, 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 by middle age, I really ought to be beyond optimism, but um, I've actually had cause for optimism um, since the George Floyd protests, because it has given me occasion to see real change. And even in the backlash that we knew would follow and the intensity of efforts to squash the voices of more and more Americans who care about racial equity, there's evidence of growth. And, um, but it's growth under fire, which means that whatever opportunities we have now for change, we really better make the most of them because we have listening audiences. It's not just progressive cities. It's lots of progressive people or people experiencing progressive thoughts in all sorts of places under all kinds of rocks in America right now where you just would not expect it. And so I would just say, you know, first of all, let's be thankful that that energy is out there, that things that would have been tolerable four or five years ago are intolerable to many more Americans today, and that this op offers us a real opportunity to do what? To run with one good idea. I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but, <laughs> but what we're so often in looking for is the space in which to make good ideas work. And so I see some more fertile space to do it. So whatever your one good idea is, this is the time to ramp it up because I think the possibility of change is where it hasn't been in a long time. Thank you. I concur with that. I think the, the politics, the math behind creating a functioning multiracial politics where a critical mass of what I call culturally dexterous whites, whites who are open to diversity and, and, and not threatened by the decentering of whiteness, right? The loss of centrality of whiteness, want to be part of the coalition to, to, to create a, a, a better society to make it work. The math is getting easier to do that. But right now, at the national level, a lot of states, popular will is affirmatively suppressed, you know. Um, but in these places where it's not, you know. There are a lot of people who are open to trying things. And so, but you got, you know, run for office, get your vision, you know, you got to, um, you know, get, build your coalition or join the coalition wherever you are and engage and yes, and, and, and drive your one good idea. I think there are a lot of really exciting ideas out there right now, though. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I would just echo what, what others have said, but I think the, um, I would point to building institutions and building institutions that, that working people control. And I think, you know, whether that means building a union or, 
you know, getting involved in a neighborhood or, or association or, you know, a, a civil rights organization. Um, but those are the things that are going to allow us to put really good ideas into action. Um, I, I, I always come back to a story that I read um, actually involving uh, Morehouse. And in 1945, A. Philip Randolph spoke to the Morehouse graduation, the commencement ceremony. And he said to the, to the young Morehouse men, make a 20 year plan and, and, and figure out how you're going to you know, fight for freedom over the next 20 years. And um, that was actually when Dr. King was a sophomore at Morehouse. I don't know if he, if he was there, but um, I, I think that's a, it's, it's still very relevant with words of wisdom to plan for the long haul and dig in. Yeah, powerful, powerful. You know, I, I couldn't have scripted ending this conversation on Morehouse College. I couldn't have scripted that. Thank you so much, <laughs> Dr. Jones, for doing that for me, doing that for me. Well, you wore the t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, and, and as, you, as you were talking about institution building, it, it reminded me, um, one of the, the president uh, was one of my mentors, is one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Robert Michael Franklin, uh, in his book on moral leadership. One, one of the hallmarks of moral leadership is building institutions that last. That's what he says in his book. So that, that isn't for building institutions that matter. Building institutions that last is really important uh, for this work. Uh, black churches have been that. Uh, black, black colleges and universities, HBCUs, uh, have, have been that. And, and uh, you know, Building One America is 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 being that uh, in in the world uh, right now. So thank you for for underwriting a reason for us to 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 ask for things to keep us sustainable after uh, this this event. So thank thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jones. Thank you so much, Professor Cashin. Thank you so much, Professor Trout, uh, for for being with us and and lending us uh, invaluable wisdom as we continue to to movement build. Listen, this is a time of action that we're preparing for each week. We've con we've con concluded this experience by naming the fact that we want to make Governor Murphy a champion. We want to make Governor Murphy a hero. He just refuses to be the hero in the story of New Jersey. I don't understand how you can be on the board of the, of the NAACP National, how you can give all the money to the NAACP, run as a civil rights governor, and then still refuse to be a hero when you have a coalition like Building One America in New Jersey Cares trying to make him a hero. He just won't do it. And so we're going to give him we're going to give him another opportunity uh, to 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 become a hero. Uh, we have a letter that we have drafted. We've 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 um, we, we've distributed for uh, for collecting signatures over since King Day, since since King Day. We've been gathering signatures for this letter since the governor uh, does not want to sit down with our coalition. Uh, he wants to ignore our coalition. He wants to pretend as if segregation has not gotten worse under his belt in terms of our schools. Uh, we're going to have to talk to his friends. So we have a letter that we are sending to his friends. And by friends, we mean his big donors. Uh, we know that the governor is getting ready to be the top governor uh, of the American Governors Association, the top governor of the Democratic Governors Association in the next couple of years. And I just know that his progressive friends would be surprised that a civil rights governor does not want to be a hero when we are giving, we are handing this to him. And so we're going to help him out again. And this time we're going to help him out by talking to his friends. And I'm sure that his friends will tell him, you need to meet uh, with that coalition uh, that is primarily based in, in South Jersey because they have the answer uh, that will make you a hero. That's, that's just it. He'll become a hero. Our children will have better educational experiences. The outcomes will increase dramatically. You know, desegregating will actually help with property taxes. We want to make him a hero. And so if you sign this letter, sign this letter, it is in the chat. It's in the chat. Uh, you'll do the work of making Governor Murphy uh, actually live by his own rules, uh, <laughs> you know, live by his own code uh, and, and, and actually do the work uh, that Black folk, brown folk, working class folk have sent him uh, to, to, to Trenton to do uh, for us uh, by, by, by our vote. So make sure that before you log off, you take some time to access 
uh, that, that, that letter. Also, uh, we want to make sure uh, that our authors who are with us today, that you have access links to their books. I believe, uh, Brother Scully, have you put those in the chat as well? We want to do that uh, before we leave today. We'll also make that. I'm sorry. Take care of it. Oh, yeah, yeah. oh, good, 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 good. We'll also make sure we'll make sure those links are available in our post our post event uh, email uh, so that you'll you'll be able to, to follow with those and share those broadly uh, with as many as many folk as you know, uh, love knowledge and, and love to love love to engage uh, this 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 particular content. We're going to conclude right now. Thank you all again for three weeks I'm four weeks four weeks I'm sorry of, of, of engagement. Uh, these these particular these particular uh, these particular conversations will be made available by link as well so you will receive links to these to these conversations as well so again just thank you uh, for coming into our digital brush harbor uh, outside of the gaze of racial capitalism outside of the gaze of whiteness just for a moment as we talk about uh, how we how we continue to build this 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 movement of somebodyness and attacking the nobodyness that attempts to to swallow us uh, in so many sectors of, of American life. I leave with this benediction. Now unto you, O God, who's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think according to the power at work in all of us. To you, God, be glory, power, and to us be justice, freedom, and reparation is in the name of those values that we pray. Amen. You all Amen. have a great Wednesday evening. Stay safe. And we look forward to being in touch as we start this month, this, this, the rest of the year of action and activism so that we can make Governor Murphy a hero. Take care. <laughs> Good night. I enjoyed it. Good night, it. everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.